tryna keep it all clear. I got way too many thoughts. But in these expectations, got me feeling stuck like Well, good evening, everybody. See you tonight. Thanks for being here. Hope you're doing all right. Thanks for being here tonight. Seriously, it's uh, you, you never know. I know that I say that often, but that is the truth. Maybe I'm just showing my uh, uh, my anxiety. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you made it out tonight. Glad you're here safe. And uh, crazy. I I was telling the staff uh, this morning, moved some meetings around. I was telling them, I hate talking about the weather uh, because I hate small talk. Uh, I do care about people, but like small talk drives me nuts. So I, anytime I'm like, man, it's crazy weather. I'm like, ah, small talk. Dang it. I hate doing that. So, but it has been nuts. And uh, this morning it was so stinging cold. I think uh, uh, one of the guys told me it was like negative 17 when he woke up. Like that's what his thermostat said or whatever. Like for his uh, car, I'm like, yeah, therm- <laughs> thermostat. Yeah, it's cold. Yeah, Jen told me that too. They don't even know what to do with ice or anything. What's that? I lived down there for six years of my life. I lived in Dallas for six years. Two when I was a kid and four for college. Jen and I lived down there the first year of our wedding or our marriage. The first year of our wedding. It was real long. <laughs> Dude, I'm in trouble tonight already. I just want you guys to know there's no telling what happens tonight. Uh, yeah, real expensive wedding. Uh, but anyway, so we lived down there. And I remember one year it snowed. And no, that's every week. I'm used to it, dear. That's okay. And I remember, again, so it wasn't like, a, hey, let's go sledding right now. It's the best thing ever. There were so many of these that were going to the cafeteria, hijacking all of the trays and sledding. And I was like, you guys are idiots. First of all, that's not a sled. Like, it was just, just very strange. But uh, anyways, you do what you do. So anyways, glad you're here tonight. We're having folks watching online, which is awesome. So thanks to all those folks uh, that are watching online and participating in that way. But uh, it's a good thing. So let's pray together, and we'll get started tonight. God, thank you for this evening. Thank you for one another. I pray for just a blessing tonight as we open your word. I pray you teach us uh, some things tonight. I pray, Lord, for those that... uh, um, uh, need encouragement, God. I pray that they'd find encouragement, Lord, in your word tonight, but also in your people. And uh, lo- those, Lord, who uh, are feeling alone to participate and be part of uh, community in that way, what we have here. And so I just thank you, Lord, for all of those uh, avenues and just the ability to be together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's good to see you. Has anybody have any questions uh, to start out tonight? I always like to, of course, you, one of you two do. So it wouldn't be a Wednesday night without that. Anyways, so could you pass that back? We'll just pass it through a bunch of people. No, it's great. I I do like questions. Uh, Some of them make me nervous, especially because I've already made several verbal, like, blunders tonight. I'm like, who knows what I'm about to get who knows how I'll answer, so My go ahead. questions about Job. Okay. And Job's friends. Okay. Um, are any of them at all right? Or were they just like completely, did they just botch it? All right, so let's go to Job. So open your Bible to the middle. You'll get Psalms. And then go to the left. And you'll find maybe a book that you might see uh, as job. I don't mean to insult anybody, right? I, I'm sure people hold up like, there's this book called Job. Maybe that's about my job. Like, I don't know. Maybe that's happened before. Um, Job chapter 42. So, 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this opportunity to help you with something. Um, so hold your spot there and go to the table of contents, okay? For some of you, this will be like old hat. This won't be anything new. For some of you, this will, will help tremendously, and uh, we'll be encouraged by that. So we have in the Scripture, we have 66 books, okay? So there are 66 books of the Bible. Um, that's not a, like a sacred number. You know, don't try to flip it over and be like, it's two nines, and that's symbolic of Jesus and his faithfulness to the 99, and where's the one? I, people do all kinds of weird things when it comes to numbers, okay? So just, it's 66, okay? We could combine First and Second Samuel into just one big, long book. Like, that wouldn't be bad, and we'd have 65, okay? Like, it's, it's okay, all right? So if you'll notice, I'm a little cynical when it comes to, like, numerology stuff, okay? So 66 books, so what you'll have is you have uh, the Old and New, I can't even draw, write tonight, you'll have the Old and New Testament, so we sometimes will shorten those, abbreviate them, Old Testament, New Testament, right? So from Genesis to Deuteronomy, these are what we know as the books of Moses, okay? So Moses is our author there. And uh, they're also called the Pentateuch. Okay? And I did that because I can't remember exactly how to spell Pentateuch. I'm, I'm running away. <laughs> the U and the A, I know it's a CH, right? <laughs> exactly. The Penta, right? So Pentateuch, right? So then after that, you get to. You'll go Joshua really to Nehemiah. Okay, and these are really history, okay? Those are what we call history or historical books. And that is, if you want to mark them in your Bible, Nehemiah is when the chronological story of the Old Testament ends, okay? Actually, Nehemiah and Esther, but Esther, you could throw Esther's back in there. I'll give you kind of a bracket there. Okay, so that's, those are kind of your historical books of the Bible. So beginning to um, Nehemiah. So after that, uh, Nehemiah, then you're going to get Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, okay? Or sometimes it's called Song of Songs, which that's okay too. Those are... Po That's one of the creepiest things I've ever heard. You put that on, so it's gonna at eight o'clock. It's gonna be, it's eight o'clock. Can you imagine if I was like downstairs and that thing went off in the kids' schoolroom? I'm glad you guys witnessed that. <laughs> no doubt. I love you. No doubt. All right, so those are our poetry books, okay? So Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon, those are our, our poetry books, okay? And so when we read these different books, so Isaiah after that is our, and basically everything after that, I'm just going to do it this way. Some of them divided into major prophets, minor prophets. So Isaiah to the end of the Old Testament is prophets. Some are what we call major prophets. Some are minor prophets. Really, the distinction is length of ministry. So Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah also wrote Lamentations and Ezekiel and Daniel. Those are typically classified as the major prophets. They had really long, prolonged ministries to multiple nations in some points and multiple kings and so on and so forth. And then after that, you'll get to some minor prophets that we, you know, 
shorter ministries or more like focused uh, ministries. But those are the prophets. Well, all of those prophets, and this is kind of important when you read through the Bible, all of those prophets, their prophecies belong back during this time. It's not that their prophecies were all fulfilled during that time, but these were men who lived during this time period, primarily this time period. And so that's when you get into like, who is Isaiah talking to? And so typically when we read a, a book, we start at page one, you know, no one picks up in the latest novel that they want to read. And, you know, I'm going to skip the first 500 pages. I'm just going to pick up on page 501 because that doesn't make any sense, right? Because you're like, what, who are these characters? What's going on? What's the setting? And so on and so forth. And that, that makes sense. And so a lot of people do that with the Bible. And so they start in Genesis and they get to Exodus and like, okay, and they get to the later part of Exodus and they're like, oh, this is interesting. And then they get to Numbers and they quit. And, or Leviticus, Leviticus, and then they not make it through Leviticus. They'll skip to the Numbers, few, you know, things there, Deuteronomy. But what you're looking at here, this is the chronology right here, Genesis to Nehemiah. And then these later on fit back into here. Now, what's interesting about Job is Job is the oldest complete book of the Bible. So Job predates all of these books, okay? So the Bible, Moses started writing about 1500 B.C., okay? And I believe, some would say a little bit different, maybe by a 30 year or so, but I believe the Bible is written until about 96 A.D. or in new stuff for the common era and then common era which don't be offended by those. It's just the way things go, okay? So that's about your time span uh, of things. Well, Job predates that, okay? Uh, Job predates that, so it's, a, it's an old book. A few fun things about Job, okay? And we'll answer that question. Job is a great book that mentions two dinosaurs, Okay? which is super fun. Uh, he mentions them in chapter 41. So you will see the dinosaur mentioned there named Leviathan. And then back just a chapter, a few verses, chapter 40, verse 15, you'll see the second dinosaur described by Job as behemoth. So um, when any, whenever anybody says to you, well, the Bible doesn't mention dinosaurs, you get, what is it? Yes, it does. And uh, it's two fascinating descriptions, but I want, you to, I want you to realize this, okay? You gotta remember what you're reading. When you read Job, you're reading poetry, okay? Poetry tells a truth, right? Poetry is communicating some things, but it's not communicating things in the same way that history is communicating things. So Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, is not poetry. That's history, Okay? And so there's, there's a difference between looking at those passages uh, of Scripture. So the story of Job, we're going to come to the ending. It's the best part. <laughs> so Job is brought up in a conversation in heaven between God and Satan. Now, what's happening? What type of book is Job? I'm going to ask you to answer this. Poetry, Poetry okay? So it's, it's poetry. doesn't mean it's not factual, but its purpose isn't necessarily to teach history or timelines or uh, even deep doctrines, okay? So just you got to hang on there. So Job is brought up in a conversation between Satan and God, and God says, hey, to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? And Job, and Satan says, well, yeah, but he loves you because you've blessed him so much. And so God says, okay, well, you can take everything from him, but you cannot kill him. And so it says Satan leaves the presence of God, goes and kills uh, Job's kids. Uh, his business is lost all in a day. It's a really a devastating story. Job ends the chapter, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Like, it's crazy. So some time goes by. God and Satan have another conversation. Have you seen my servant Job? Satan says, well, sure, he's still your servant because, um, because you protected him. And Satan's like, people will 
people will say and do all kinds of different things if they're basically in physical suffering. That's a paraphrase of what Satan says to God. And so God says, okay, you can afflict him, but you cannot kill him. And um, so Satan leaves the presence of God and goes and afflicts Job with great boils. And so he suffers. So you can imagine as the story unfolds, people are hearing the news of Job. And it's like, what did Job do to make God mad, right? He must have done something, right? Now, God forbid, I don't, even, I don't even want to say this out loud, but let's imagine tomorrow all of my kids die, God forbid, and next week I am, you know, diagnosed as terminally ill. Somebody's going to say, what'd you do to God? Like, were you faking this whole time? Like, there's going to be some questions there, right? And so these things start to happen. So a few of Job's friends show up. Three primary friends and then like a younger guy who stays pretty silent until the very end. And Job has this back and forth conversation with them. And it's quite frustrating. Now to Allison, to your point, it's not that Job's friends... Um, are not asking good questions, right? They're, they're talking about some things. I think some of them, I think the oldest one really, really likes to hear himself talk. Um, and so there's some, some interesting dialogue there back and forth. Well, here's God's response at the end of it, right? Job 42, after the Lord had spoken these words to Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, my anger burns against you and against your two friends. For you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. And I think that is the most important theme of the book right there. And, and I don't want you to miss that. I think he actually uh, states it uh, maybe one more time, but that's it right there. I want you to see that. The end of verse 7, my servant Job. What do we see there that's really, really important? We see that Job was wealthy and healthy and had everything, and was one of the most prominent men in the entire world. And God said, it's my servant. Meaning, it doesn't matter what your position is here on earth, we all, are, we all belong to God, right? We are servants of the Lord. But it's not necessarily in, an, in a rigid ownership way that God is saying it. It's in a, in a I'm proud of this man, right? I love this man. He, this, this man brings me glory. So Job goes from being a father of many sons and daughters, sounds like Father Abraham, I'm sorry about that, to having no children and no heirs, but what does he remain? He remains, he remains a servant of God. He goes from being healthy and prosperous to having no health, and what happens? He's still a servant of God. And you come to the end of the book, and God still says, he's my servant. So uh, to your, your point there, Allison, I, I think God was mad at the three older friends for coming to Job. And I think primarily what the Lord is saying there is that you have not spoken of me what is right. That's not necessarily about Job or some insights into Job that were all wrong or all bad. But what they were saying about God was not awesome. And, um, and so... Um, so the story ends, Job's fortunes are restored, and um, verse 12 there, the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And um, you'll see the second daughter there, verse 14, uh, so you'll see Jemima, and then you'll see the name Keziah. So we actually, our, um, our uh, location pastor at Burton, so his daughter is Keziah. So Ryan Story's daughter is Keziah. And um, so kind of sweet, yeah. So anyway, so that's what I would say about his friends. Is I don't think necessarily what they were saying about themselves was all flawed or what they were saying about Job. But God's beef with them at the end of the day is you, you did not testify about me what was right. Now the conversation, just one more point about this. Job's friends are there. Job's friends are there. Job's friends are there. Finally, Job just like is going to God because he's broken. And then finally God speaks. And uh, he speaks much shorter than all the friends, uh, but it is real succinct and real pointed and uh, essentially affirms Isaiah 33, Job, I'm God, and you're not. 
Like you weren't there at the beginning and I was. And that's one of the demonstrations about the, these great dinosaurs there in chapter 40 and chapter 41. Yeah, please. You in John chapter 9, the blind man. So we see in the beginning, we see the spiritual conversation between Satan and God saying, have you considered my servant Job? And this is stuff that Job and none of his friends are privy to. They don't know that this conversation has happened. They don't know that for this purpose, God is allowing this so that he be glorified. And then here we have the blind man that he's blind so that God is glorified. Yeah, I mean, it's what we talked about last week a little bit, right? The four most important truths that I, I believe, right? God's in complete control. All things exist for his glory. So it is it is similar to John 9. Those are passages that I would use together. It's also uh, Exodus, I think it's 3 and 4, Moses at the burning bush. And uh, Moses said, I can't talk. And uh, God says, who made man's mouth? Who made the blind? Who made the dumb? Who made him speaking? Who made him seeing? I'm the Lord, I do all of this. And again, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. So the Lord s- says that he does that. And, and then we see more throughout the scripture, his purposes in doing that ultimately for his glory. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, again, the book of Job is, it's a tough read. As much of it as that you can read at one time is best because you're really stepping in the middle of a conversation. So just imagine two friends talking back and forth with each other. And, um, and you can feel Job's frustration with his friends. Like, I thought you were with my friends. Thanks a lot. This has been super miserable. Uh, there are some good points about grieving there. They do show up. And for the first, how many days, Jen? For the first, yeah, they just sit there quietly. They don't say anything. So there's some positive there. Like, hey, I mean, they probably should have done it for another seven days, honestly. But they sat there for a while to just be with their friend in his suffering. So some good principles there. Love my whiteboard. Thank you, John. Just want to say it again. Okay. I have a Catholicism question. Oh, man. Okay. (laughs) Um, Obviously, today is Ash Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I heard on the radio today them talking to, whether it was a priest or bishop or whatever, who said because of COVID, they're now, instead of placing the ash, they're sprinkling the ash on people. And he said he learned this when he was in Rome with the Holy Father, and it's throughout the Old Testament that it talks about this. Is there examples of that? Because I, again, yes. I don't know Catholicism, but I've never heard this. It's wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's just say it this way. Let's start with this. Religion is real weird. It just is. People, um, like yesterday was Fat Tuesday. You know, which when I see it on the calendar, I know I'm getting poonchkis, which is awesome. So I got poonchkis for the staff yesterday, but then we canceled our meeting, so I had to wait till today to eat them. Not as good the next day. Uh, still good. Uh, custard filled is my go-to from now on, just so you know. Uh, it's just, it's a once a year. Anyways, so... And so, yeah, Fat Tuesday, right? And then we begin Lent, right? The lead up to uh, Good Friday and Easter and all these different things, right? So the, the calendar. So ashes, right? Ashes were a symbol of um, uh, repentance, right? Of mourning. Uh, the one that I can think offhand would be Jonah. Um I know there will be many of them, but this is the one I can think of offhand. So Jonah goes and he preaches to Nineveh. Jonah's one of those minor prophets. Minor, not because he wasn't important. Okay. So there in Jonah. Take your time to get there. These are all like good experiences if you're not super well versed in the Bible. Take your time. So it's going to be in the Old Testament. So if you're into the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you've gone too far. Back up. Take a left. 
It's tucked in there. It's after Obadiah, which is a sh super short book, but you'll probably miss, so don't worry. But Jonah is a preacher. He's sent by God to Nineveh. Jonah is the Jonah and the great fish. It's not a whale. Sorry. Ruins the whole story. Except for I do like the Jonah reference in the first Avengers movie. It makes me smile. Um, you get that reference? Okay, good. Sometimes I make these nerd references and people are like, oh, you're a huge nerd, Josh. And I'm like, so. <laughs> I'm all good. All right, so, uh, so Jonah chapter 3, verse 12. He goes there, he proclaims God's judgment is coming on the city. Word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Okay, so you can see there it's, um, the whole idea is he is in, he is in sackcloth. He's really taking a, a physical posture. What he is wearing is symbolic of his, um, his repentance, his grief, his fear, his sorrow, all those things. So then you have, he sat in ashes. I'm sure there is a symbol, like a, like a scriptural understanding of ashes and um, how, why people did that throughout the Old Testament. I do not know that offhand. Um, but yeah, so there's a, there's a connection between ashes and repentance and mourning and repenting of sin, turning from sin and all those things. So... Um, actual fact of sprinkling people with ashes isn't a common theme. I would, I, no, okay. not that I know of. I mean, I could have brought some ashes tonight. We could have like done that. I, I don't know. I do remember for me, just a, an interesting story. I remember being in college and my senior year. So the, the year of our year long wedding, uh, we, we were, I had to go to a junior college around the corner to take Spanish. So, so that I could graduate. So the Lord worked everything out. So I took four semesters of Spanish in two. And uh, it, I still don't speak Spanish, which is an embarrassment. As <laughs> soon as I got my three A's and a B, I'm like, sweet. I got my degree. I'm out the door. Uh, cool story with my professor and everything. But uh, there was a girl that came in on Ash Wednesday. I didn't know it. I didn't know what Ash Wednesday was. I did not grow up Catholic. I did not grow up. I grew up in a very, like, like, Baptist bubble, you know, so I didn't know a lot of those different things. And I remember having ashes on her forehead and I, I was going to say something and I thank the Lord above because I felt the Holy Spirit be like, shut up. And then I'm like, well, this poor girl's got this thing all over her face. And I, you just, I just shut up. And then finally it was like, Hey, it's Ash Wednesday. I'm like, son of a gun. That's what that is right there. So I, uh, I was thankful that I did not in, embarrass myself uh, with my uh, cultural uh, ignorance there. But um, yeah, so it's just a symbol of mourning, of, of weeping, of repenting, of turning from sin, of sorrow. But again, it's Ash Wednesday, not ash and sackcloth and all this different. So it's traditions have really, in many ways, robbed the heart behind Right, repentance is an act of the heart, right? Well, we may look at this Sunday, I don't know, we'll see where the Lord leads, but Psalm 51, the ending of it is, David says, I hate the paraphrasing, by the way, I'm sick of paraphrasing stuff. Let me just read it. He says, you, you won't delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. So he says, listen, you, God, you do not want sacrifice first. You want a broken heart. Then later on, you'll see verse 19, then you will delight in the right sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings and, and so forth, right? So, um, yeah, some of these traditions just become that, right? Do I think there's anything wrong before God if you have a heart of repentance for sin, putting some ashes on your forehead or sitting in ashes? No, but you also don't have to to be repentant. And... Um, so there's a whole lot of people today who were, you know, devout Catholics and some of your family members or you, I don't know, I didn't see anybody's forehead too close, right? And uh, who, who went to Mass today, who went to Ash Wednesday services or whatever it may be. Um, 
who really don't understand the heart of, behind what repentance uh, repentance is. And so tradition really, man, religion is just so weird. It's just the things we do and then accept as normal, and it's like, okay. So, and I think a lot of like, I, I think honestly, things like COVID has, have exposed some of those things, right? We don't have to meet in a building. We don't have to meet in this building. This building is not sacred. But for many Christians, right, it was like, oh man, we got to get back in the building. We got to get back in the building. It's like, well, I want to get back together, but I don't really care if it's back in the building or not. Like, it'd be somewhere else. And um, so a lot of the traditions, so then you find like things like these crises make religious people invent a whole nother like, hey, I, you know, I was looking the other day, I found a loophole, right? And it's like, <laughs> no, you didn't. Like, st stick to your guns. If you believe that, stick to it or, or don't, right? So, no, I don't know about the sprinkling of ashes. Maybe that's a was done. I mean, Moses did grind up the, the, um, the golden calf, uh, sprinkle it in, in water and make them drink it. So I, I don't know. Those would be some ashes. Like, I don't think the priest was advocating for that at all. Like, so I don't know. But my answer to that would be religion is weird. It's just weird. It makes, makes people do weird things, and it makes people talk in a weird way. And like, what? Just be a normal, normal person. So anyways, anybody else? Any questions about anything? We were um, <clears throat> doing a devotion together, and and I I love MacArthur. We listened to Tale of Two Preachers. It was so good. But oh, did you listen to it? It was so good. Yeah, but it's one of my th favorites. This is about okay. I just I just want to read Revelation fourteen. It says, "Oh, that's awesome." It's about the mark of the beast, and it says. Um, <laughs> and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And then there's other verses where it talks about whoever has the mark of the beast. It it makes it sound like if you and during the tribulation, if you have the mark of the beast, you have no hope of being saved. Um, and we were debating about this. That's why I'm bringing it up because I I want to know what your. I mean, it's not, because what MacArthur said, and I feel bad for him, I think he got crucified for it. He said you can, um, you you know, the mark of the beast is not the unpardonable sin. You can be, you can repent of it, yes. And when I heard him say that, I was kind of surprised because what I'm reading in Scripture, it sounds so like. So you, you and Craig disagree about this? Well, I think we agree now. We agree now, but I don't want to tell you what we the conclusion we came to. So there's a proverb to. that says, a man who gets involved in a quarrel not his own is like one who takes a passing dog by the ear. Uh, yeah, you always get bit. Uh, it doesn't <laughs> no, say you I'm, always I'm get serious. bit. No, I'm serious. I just, I just love to know your, your thoughts on that because we really, we did come to the same conclusion. You want to know what our conclusion was? <laughs> I don't know. I want to know yours before okay, I tell right, you okay. ours is. <laughs> uh, so let's, yeah, wow. The mark of the beast has gotten a lot of play over the last uh, few months, particularly over the last year. And um, I got to be careful how I say this because I do not want to be uh, needlessly uh, offensive. The COVID vaccine is not the mark of the beast, okay? It's, it's not. Now, at some point, could something like that become the mark of the beast? Maybe. But from my whole life, and some of you are younger than me, some of you are older than me, if you've been in Christian circles for any period of time, there has been so much talk about what the mark of the beast actually is, 
and these microchips and all these different things. And it's like we don't even use half the technology that people were convinced, you know, in 1988 what the mark of the beast was going to be. So the mark of the beast is some sort of mark. And I'm going to be intentionally vague about it because John doesn't give us the exact like, hey, it's going to be a square, it's going to be a rectangle. He doesn't even say it's going to be 666, right? Like that would be so obvious, right? What do you have tattooed on your forehead? Oh, it's 666. Oh, the mark of the beast, son of a gun. I knew it was coming. Like, <laughs> like, like it, I think people are, what the mark of the beast is, a mark of the beast, the mark of the beast during the tribulation is an allegiance to the kingdom of the Antichrist. And the kingdom of the Antichrist is twofold. It is both political and it is spiritual. So there are two figures. There is the Antichrist. The false prophet. And the false prophet leads the world in worship of the Antichrist. Okay? So this is, you know, again, political and religious and unites the religions of the world and brings world peace for a time. Unites, you know, all these different things that seem to be impossible to unite. Well, what the Antichrist demands is that to, you know, again, religious, political, economic implications is some sort of mark to buy, sell, and trade. And so the Bible says it'll be on the hand and, and or on the forehead. That's what it says. And so, again, Christians for a long time have been trying to guess what that will look like and when that will come around. And, again, I've heard it, various things in the last few months, like don't get vaccinated, it's the mark of the beast. I just want you to know this. You will know what the mark of the beast is. Because the mark of the beast aligns you with, sorry for my super logical, simple brain, the beast. Not beauty and the beast, right? But the beast, right? It aligns you with the Antichrist, who is the beast, right? It's the mark. It's not like they're going to advertise it like, hey, sign up, go get the mark of the beast. But if this man who... 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about, he's called the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. So perdition being hell, right? The son of hell, man of lawlessness. If he shows up, and which I believe Christians... I hope people online can hear that. It's like, what the heck? Call there. Be like, there, help. You come fix it. Oh my gosh. So, so 730 if you're wondering. So, yeah, it's exactly what it is. You did that on purpose, didn't you? I can barely turn it on. I'm going to set a timer. This is true. So, the, the beast... The mark of the beast, the Antichrist, in my view of end times, believers will be here for what's known as the tribulation, not the great tribulation. The great tribulation starts from my reading of scripture in Revelation 6. At the end of Revelation 6, the sixth seal is broken, and that is what's known as the day of the Lord or the great day of God's wrath. At that point... Um, I, I believe that there will be a mark of the beast prior to that. Um, but I would, I would have to agree with MacArthur that it's not the un, it's not, um, the unforgivable sin proper, right? That makes, it's not like Jesus was like, and there is one unforgivable sin, the mark of the beast. The one unforgivable sin is denial of the Holy Spirit, blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It is the rejection of the gospel. So if people do take the mark of the beast and have rejected the gospel, well, 
I think we're splitting hairs to say one is not the unforgivable sin or the other, right? If you've rejected Christ, that is the unforgivable sin. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Conviction of sin, righteousness, all those things Jesus sent the Holy Spirit for. So uh, at that point, past the day of the Lord, anybody who has the mark of the beast has rejected Christ and they, are, they will experience literal, this is crazy to say out loud, they will experience literal hell on earth. They will experience the righteous wrath of God on the earth. And that's, you know, that's Revelation 6, the very last phrase, I think, of that chapter uh, even says, yeah, for the great day of the wrath has come, who can stand? And by implication of the question, it is nobody, like nobody. The church, the people of God have been taken out at that point in the rapture. Uh, prior to the rapture, many believers will be persecuted and martyred for the cause of the gospel. And, um, and after that's the wrath of God. So after that, nobody will be saved. After that, it's, it's game over. It is, it is the wrath of God. And the people of God who, that's, you know, Jesus talks about the wedding doors being shut, right? He talks about these things like it's, it's Noah in the ark. The door of the ark is closed. Doesn't matter if you want to get in after, the door has been shut. And, and that's that point. So um, prior to that, sure, I guess someone could get the mark of the beast and still, be, still get saved after that. I don't know. But it is an alignment. That mark is in an alignment with um, the Antichrist. So that's what it is. So let me pass that back there. Well, let's hold on. I want to. There's people online. I think. Yes. You don't have to do anything. It should be on. Um. Just for my clarification, I guess, uh, I don't know if anybody else is, I guess, questioning this uh, at all, but uh, the mark of the beast is a, uh, a knowing, you, you are fully conscious of accepting the mark of the beast yes. as the mark of the beast. You yeah, know you're aligning this is yourself you with the kingdom of the Antichrist. Okay, so there's no, like, tricking anybody into it. It is, you That's are exactly making that right. decision. So let's, let's look at the Antichrist, some of his activities. First Thessalonians, or excuse me, Second Thessalonians. This is my go-to chapter on this. I don't know if the Antichrist is alive. There's a lot of Christians when Obama got elected. Obama's the Antichrist. Like I've heard all kinds of crazy stuff. Henry Kissinger was going to be the Antichrist. Prince Charles. Prince Charles. His mom won't die, so he can't be. <laughs> It's against, yeah, it's taking the place of. Well, there's always, there is the spirit of the Antichrist, First John. Again, John is the only one who talks about this, uses this phrase, Antichrist, right? So John talks about the spirit of the Antichrist, like many Antichrists have gone out into the world. But then what we're talking about is the, right? So this would be proper. This is, we would say, like the one and the only, not really the only, but the one. Like this is, this is the embodiment of, all satanic power. And um, so here it is, 2 Thessalonians. And I'm just going to read it because I think this is a great, I think this is a great overarching answer to your question there. Chapter 2, verse 1, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus and our being gathered together to Him. So that's, the word rapture is not in the Bible, but that's just how it's described. Our gathering, our being gathered together to him. We ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarm, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So what's being talked about here is the day of the Lord. Scripture says, verse 3, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes a seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So what the Antichrist will do is the Antichrist will seek to right, unite, unite world powers, right, unite world governments, 
They want to unite world religions. And he will proclaim himself to be God. And he will receive worship as God. So when a world figure shows up who can accomplish these things and presents himself to be God, he's the devil. And that's what the scripture says. So Jesus tells us these things. He said, I'm telling you these things so you don't have to be surprised or shocked. Um, so you won't be duped. So people will... I guess I want to rephrase the way that I said something earlier to you. People will knowingly follow the Antichrist or not. Okay, so people will look at whoever this person is and say, okay, I'm following him. I don't think there's really an idea that it could be a her. So I'm following him. And I'm seeing these things happen. And this is a, this is a matter of worship. So it's not going to be an accidental thing. So again, I think a lot has been made about different things. If you feel a conviction or have a desire or have gone and got a COVID-19 vaccination, that's, that's your prerogative. That's up to you. The people have tried to tie all kinds of spiritual things to that, which I think are erroneous and wrong. And uh, frankly, outs, if I could draw the lanes of authority on here, I ran out of whiteboard, John. Uh, that's right. <laughs> right? That's outside of my lane of authority. Right? Your medical decisions are your medical decisions. And um, the, I, I, don't have a, I don't have bearing on that. That's, that's not my responsibility to tell uh, a man or a woman what medical decisions to make for themselves and for their home and for their children. That's not my responsibility. And um, so a lot of Christians, particularly pastors, have just gotten wackadoo on all kinds of stuff. So this is what I would say about the mark of the beast and who the antichrist is no i do not think there will be a oh gosh i got the i got the mark of the beast i didn't even know it how did that get on there i don't think we're talking about that this this will be a whether a person is deceived or not they will make a willful choice they will make a decision to follow a really the god of the bible or the god of this world and that's really what it will come down to okay so we'll wait for the mic sorry I really want to get to the lesson tonight too. Roy wrote it. He's fantastic. With with these three these things that you put up here and things like isn't this And these are just three things. I mean there's other things. Right, but isn't this kind of like what the I feel like the Pope is doing? Like you trying to unite everything, trying to change Well, now you're going to just going to get me in trouble on Ash Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> So, gosh, I don't even. Yeah, no, I, I think so, I mean, Thayer has the camera over there. People call me. Does he? Okay. <laughs> no, I, I want to think about. So, no, it's it's a gr it's a really fascinating question. Um, I want to be respectful to people, like because there's there's some people in here. That have, Catholic backgrounds or Catholic family members or people watching online that are from a Catholic background or whatever it might be. Uh, and there are people who are Catholics who love Jesus, who believe that Jesus died and rose again and you know have repented of their sin and believed in the Lord for salvation. There's no doubt about it. So, but we have to split some things that are really important. God has his people everywhere. He does, right? Uh, Elijah had to be reminded of that, right? He thought he was the only one, and God's like, no, there's like 500, or there's, like, there's hundreds of people that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Like, you're not the only guy, so don't worry. So there are, there are followers of Jesus who are Methodists and Catholics and Pentecostals and Presbyterians and Episcopals, and there, there are you know, Anglicans, right? There are God's people all over the place. And then, of course, in all of those types of labels there are frauds there there are people who are self-deceived 
And there are people who aren't deceived who are just making bank deceiving other people. And um, so looking out for those false teachers. Um, the Pope, the very position of the Pope is blasphemy. It's, it's blasphemy. It is blasphemy against God to say that any person for any portion of time is sinless. That's blasphemy, right? First John says that he who has no sin is a liar and the truth is not in him. So that's blasphemy to say that. that it, that's an assault on the perfection of Christ. If anybody else has been perfect for any period of time, now we're on par with Christ? Like, no, we are all, all have sin and fall short of the glory of God. So there are things like that. Papal decree, um, things that the Pope says are not on par with the Scripture. Uh, well, well, sure. He, well, they, but that, that's how, not just him, right? That would be that would be derogatory against people in general. There have been people for centuries who have tried to change the Scripture. So my daughter, my kids have been going through a religion curriculum, which um, I don't know. Would you strongly recommend it yet? Are you to that place? Recommend or strongly recommend or hold? I recommend the people that recommend it. Okay. So, so we were down at Answers in Genesis a few weeks ago. We went. Pretty stinking good. Real good. So, so we found a religion curriculum for our older three kids that goes through the fundamentals of Christianity and then goes through all of the false Christianities. Jehovah's Witness and Mormons and a whole slew of other things. And the Catholic Church proper. So my kids, their minds have been blown. Well, Claire found out about Jehovah's Witnesses. She's like, Dad, do we got a Jehovah's Witness Bible outside? I'm like, yeah, for sure. I'm like, it's in the study. So she goes and gets it. Comes running in the house a little bit later. Dad! And she's so mad. I'm like, whoa, what's up? They changed the Bible. And I'm like, what? She's like, I went to John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. And it says the Word was a God. And she's like, they changed the Bible. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm like, for sure. So we start perusing through there, right? So, so people have been doing this for uh, centuries. Right? People have um, been perverting the Word of God. What's really important is that God promises to preserve His Word. And um, that's important. Things like the Dead Sea Scrolls are a great testament to that. And um, one of these days, we'll have to do the Bible study that I did a few years ago, bringing a bunch of old Bibles. And uh, some of you were here for that. Uh, but it was, it was probably the best growth community I've ever done in my life. I've never come close to touching it after that, right? It was a good one where I'm like, wow, people learned, all right? Uh, but people have been perverting the Bible. But someone like the Pope to say that anything that he says is on par with what the Scripture says, that's blasphemy. That's the end of Revelation. Don't add. Don't subtract. What God says, you leave it there. And um, that's important. So the whole idea of a pope, I mean, we actually have in the world today two popes. So Benedict quit, which is really fascinating. And uh, from what I'm told, writes some critical, somewhat critical things of the Catholic Church as of late and the current pope. And then, then you get Francis, which apparently they were both in the running for a, but they claim to be like, really the the manifest presence of Christ and the apostles and all this stuff on earth, that is, that's blasphemous. And um, so to, to see that and to know that that that's wrong. And um, I don't mean to be, I, I do not mean to be critical to Catholics. I do not mince words being critical of the Catholic church. Um, Catholic communion is blasphemous. It's a re-sacrificing of Christ. That's why it's called an altar. It's the re-breaking of the body of Christ. It's the transubstantiation where the, the blood or the juice or the wine or whatever becomes the literal blood of Christ. Like, no. Like, we're now re-sacrificing Christ on a perpetual basis. And that's, that's blasphemy. Christ died once for all to save sinners. So there are loads of things right i was reading a little bit about confession today and i'm like oh my gosh like th there's there's loads of things that are that are a disaster and um man you go through the history of popes and um 
emperors of the Holy Roman Empire. And, um, you know, there were real Christians that came out of the Catholic Church, Augustine and Calvin, uh, Luther. I mean, there were real believers, real people who were born again that came out of the, the Catholic Church. But then there were also gobs and gobs of real Christians who the Catholic Church murdered, burnt at the stake. And um, so well, I, I, am no, I am no friend to the Catholic Church. I'll be friends with Catholics, people who really love Jesus, and people who don't. I'll still be their friends because I want them to know the Lord. But we, we stand against the Catholic Church. We stand against the Vatican. It's a wreck. That's about as nicely as I can say what I want to say. So I'm like sweating bullets. Like, guys, ah! so online question better be a good one, easy one. Okay. Which type of tribulations do you believe in? Pre mid or post? So then, Dan Gould's on there? Thank you, Dan. We've had this conversation. He said, pre-wrath, if I understood correctly, at the opening of the sixth seal. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's correct. Thank you, Dan, for paying attention. We talked about this a year or so ago. He came over and we talked. He brought me spicy pickles. Changed your life forever. Changed my life forever. Spicy pickles, Jack. On a turkey sandwich. Changed my life. It's real good. All right. Can you pass the mic back there? Sorry. <laughs> We are not getting to our lesson. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lady in the box. <laughs> it's it's our. This is the computer that our kids use for school, and uh, so we don't have internet or anything. But it has a DVD player, so it, they play their math curriculum and different stuff on there. So so they. It's your son. He's been playing, playing sound effects and stuff from it. 13-year-old boys. What do you do? Okay. So the, um, I guess the question about the Pope, uh, the original Pope would have been a self-proclaimed uh, Pope, right? It, I read somewhere that there were five bishops around the world, and the Pope was, he kind of ostracized himself and put himself above the other bishops and then proclaimed uh, to be a higher religion, like a higher religious leader. So Are Catholic Catholic teaching, and I'm not super well versed on Catholic dogma. Catholic teaching is that Peter was the first pope. Okay, so you get into um, you get into <laughs> Constantine and the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity. Uh, you get into all sorts of history of the Dark Ages, uh, really much of the collapse of at least Western European civilization during the Dark Ages, and you get into, um, again, a lot of history that we really didn't grow up learning. You know, most of the history we learned started in 1776, and uh honestly, and we missed a lot of what shaped the world and what shaped uh, Western thought and philosophy. But you get into the Holy Roman Empire after that, and so you get into the emperor, and you get into sometimes the emperor and the pope were the same, sometimes they were separate, sometimes there were multiples. You get into the split of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, which we know as Anglican, Right, uh, you, you get into all types of stuff until the Protestant Reformation of early 1500s, um, when different priests and monks and pastors and philosophers went to war, basically a war of ideas, to uh, correct what they had seen as a huge straying from uh, Christianity, from, from the truths of the Scripture. They weren't right about everything, right? 
Um, Martin Luther was not right about everything. Martin Luther was a deeply flawed man, and uh, we have to recognize that. Um, the only non-flawed man ever to live was Jesus Christ. And um, so if you dig deep enough on every single person in history, you will find gross things. That's just the way of the world. <laughs> it's because everyone is flawed. Everyone is fractured. So, so they would say that Peter is... Oh, gosh, I'm going to rant here in a minute. i got to be careful here. Go to Matthew 16. I'll, I'll take you there talk about this. I'm going to have to apologize to Roy for not teaching his lesson tonight. Matthew 16, this is Jesus. He asked the disciples there in verse 13, so Matthew 16, 13, who do people say that the Son of Man is? So Son of Man was a messianic title from the Old Testament. And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So basically Jesus says, who are people saying that I am? And some were saying, hey, you're John the Baptist, come back from the dead, or not have died at all, Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, Elijah, right, calling down fire from heaven, uh, stopping rain, I mean, all kinds of stuff, or one of the other prophets. And he said to them, uh, but who do you say that I am? Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This next verse, I think, is one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible, uh, both by would say it this way, Catholic and Protestant. So Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. So he's like, God's revealed this to you, who I am. He said, And I tell you, you are Peter. And so the word there is like a small pebble, like a small rock. So Petros and Petros is what's being talked about here. He said, So you're, you're Peter. And it's on this rock that I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against this. So what's, what's been the major question about this passage is what is Jesus saying? Who is right the subject of Jesus' statement and on this rock I will build my church? Is it Peter? Well, that seems strange. Is it, some would say it's the gospel, right? Some would say it's the person of Jesus Christ. And, and I actually think if we take this passage and we take what Paul talks about, what Jesus talks about, Jesus is described as the chief, I before E except after C, okay, good. <laughs> Which is not a real rule, by the way. Oh, my goodness gracious. All right, so Jesus is described as the chief cornerstone, right? So I'm going to try to do something here. It's going to be really embarrassing, so hang with me. There you go. That's the best 3D drawing you're going to get from me ever. So chief cornerstone. So in ancient times, we talked about this before, when they would build buildings, the cornerstone was not decorative. The cornerstone was what everything was going to be dictated off of. So if that chief cornerstone, right, that cornerstone was out of square, well, then the building was going to be all wonky. If that was out of level, then the whole building is going to be a mess. So that chief cornerstone, right, that cornerstone had to be square, level, plumb, right? It had to be perfect because that, everything was then going to find its square off of that. Well, Jesus is the chief cornerstone, and then what he talks about is he talks about, well, this is going to be really scary. Jen, you ever seen me do 3D drawings before? Okay. Sorry for my bad drawing. I'd like to go that way, but I don't know how to. So I'm just going to write their names here, right? And you can just imagine it going 
That way, if I was Chuck Lindsay, I could actually draw. I need to show Chuck this, right? He's going to see I drew. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And what does he do? Ephesians 5 talks about God gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, um, pastors, teachers for the building out the body of Christ, right? equipping of the saints, all these things. So what is the church built upon? Well, it's built upon, we all find our square level plumb from Christ, right? We know, right, that we are redeemed by the work of Christ. Well, then, one of the things I don't like about this passage, the interpretation of this passage, is that people say, well, he's, Jesus is talking about the gospel here. Well, he doesn't say that, right? He doesn't say that. The gesture isn't implied in the passage. It's not like there's a bracket saying Jesus touched his chest to imply himself. Well, he is the chief cornerstone, but what he's saying is, he's, I'm going to take this, you bunch of small pebbles, and I'm going to line you up as the foundation of the church. And so he took people like Peter, James, and John. Judas bailed on him. So what did he do? He went and found a 12th apostle of the Lamb whose name was Paul. And that's why in Acts chapter 2, the church was devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, where did those apostles, right? If you can imagine the lineup here, where did they find their teaching? The chief cornerstone. And then over the centuries, the church has been built upon that. So there's a special honor for these guys, right? They're not the Pope. They're not holy. We're going to talk about, I think, as the Lord is leading me this weekend to talk about Peter a little bit, they weren't like, blameless and innocent, right? They, they were flawed. But what did Jesus do? Jesus lined them up with himself, the chief cornerstone. And then he built the church on there, right? Paul, Paul calls it the pillar and buttress of the truth, right? Where the fortress, the, the testimony to the truth. So one day when we get to heaven, there will be, we've talked about this before, 12 names listed as apostles of the Lamb. And sorry, Acts chapter 1, some people are like, oh, it's going to be this other guy. Like, no, it's Paul. Okay? Paul is the last apostle of the Lamb. It's not, um, I don't remember the guy's name in Acts 1. Poor guy. It's not like he was a bad guy either. He was, he was a good dude. Matthias. Matthias, yeah, thank you. So it's not Matthias. Matthias was a follower of Jesus but he was not the 12th apostle of the Lamb. So again, if anybody claims to be an apostle of the Lamb, there's only 12. There's no more than 12. Yeah, that's it. There's apostles of the church, meaning people who are sent, but there are only 12 apostles of the Lamb. And those are the foundation of the church, along with the prophets, and we rest upon that. Okay. So, Peter is not the first pope. Peter is a portion of the foundation of the church upon which we rest. So he is great. He's to be honored, uh, but he is, he's not to be worshipped. He was not sinless at any point here on earth. Now, the other thing with the Catholic Church that is blasphemy is Mary. Okay? Let me say this. Mary's great. Right? Mary's awesome. Like Mary is a riveting and inspirational woman. She is highly favored. Right? Of all the women on planet Earth at all times, God chose to have her born at that exact time so she could carry the Son of God. Like she's awesome. Like she's worthy of respect. She's worthy of honor. She's worthy of saying, man, this is, a, this is an ex inspiring example. She is not to be worshipped or prayed to because there's only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. All right? That's it. So this is, this is another thing about... It's, it's another thing that is, at its core, satanic. Because, again, when I go to Florida on Highway 4, there's a church called Mary, Queen of Heaven. Mary's not the Queen of Heaven. She's great. Can't wait to meet her. I'm like, what the heck 
were you thinking? How was the conversation with Joseph? Right? There's many things to talk about, right? Like, what did it mean when it says you pondered all these things in your heart? <laughs> like, I just need to know. I don't know what that means, right? Like, I'm, I'm married to my wife, and I still don't understand women. Help me understand what you're pondering, right? <laughs> right? But this is the kind of stuff that, that, that is just overtly blasphemous. And part of what we have to realize about this is this is rooted back in the days of Constantine. So when Constantine converted the, the Catholic Church, or excuse me, converted Roman Empire to quote-unquote Christianity, baptized the armies, all these different things, what he did was he took all of the pagan temples and turned them into churches. And he took all of the pagan priests and he turned them into Christian priests. Well, the problem was they had a whole bunch of temples to not gods, but to goddesses. What do you do? What do you do with someone like Diana or Artemis, right? Same, same thing. What, what, do you, what do you do with that thing? And so if you want to just blow your mind, go look at old statues of Artemis and Diana and all these female gods and goddesses. Well, we can't have them worshiping a false god or goddesses. So what do we do? We give them, quote unquote, Mary, the mother of God. And that's what happened. And it is. What's that? Uh, Greek. I'd have to bring in my daughters. They're, they're ridiculous on their Greco-Roman God and goddess stuff. It's crazy what they know. It's bizarre. So anyways, so that, that's what happened. And so then it became, well, we can pray to Mary. And then it became, I've heard ladies say this to me, like, well, it just helps me because now I have a, a female that I can talk to. Right? I've heard people say, and I don't, I don't even say it to be mocking or disrespectful, but we don't get to choose who we pray to. Right? There's, only, there's only one mediator. And uh, so I'm thankful for some of the Catholic influence that taught people that Jesus died for sins and rose from the dead. I'm thankful for that. Did it say it was 8 o'clock or did it skip it? Oh, it turned out. It's 8.04. So, um, yeah, it's so creepy. So this, this, is, uh, this is a major problem. And uh, we don't get to choose who we pray to. It is, it is Jesus. He is the one mediator, the one intercessor. Okay? I know we talked about a lot of... Holy heavens. Does anybody have any follow-up questions? Because I know we hit a lot. I just want to give you a chance because we've, we've, <coughs> we've machine-gunned a lot of stuff here. What was your answer to the tribulation question? I think really curious. Was there a question online when the rapture, what do you think the rapture timeline is? Or I need a longer whiteboard. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give you a quick answer. You ready? What's that? What? To be continued. TBD? Your TV? I hate to be continues. Not, I can't even watch the movies anymore, but I remember when I was a kid and Back to the Future 2 was to be continued. I was like, seriously? What the heck just happened? Can't even watch them anymore now. It's terrible. It's sad when you realize so many movies you grew up watching are immoral. You're like, okay, like this has got sexual assault in it and a peeping Tom. And I'm like, no kids, we will not be watching this. <laughs> All right, Revelation 6. Sorry, I just ruined some of your favorite movies. <laughs> Revelation 6 is the... I've, I don't know when the last time I drew a timeline is, but this is fun. Tom Cruise worships the devil. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so what you have is you have the 
the outline of what we would call, Jesus would call the tribulation. And then after this, it's funny that this is all right here. We'll just leave it right there. Okay, this is the beast and all the stuff, different things that happen. This is known as the great tribulation. Okay, so just real quick. I know you're. St- I, you know how much I love when you write down things that I say. It's just like it's great. I told you at the end of the day, I want to end loving the Lord and my wife liking me. So it's it's a big deal. I think we're on course. Six seal. So he opens the first one, and you'll see, Behold, a white horse, verse 2, its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him. He came out conquering and to conquer. So the first seal is the Antichrist. Okay? I'm just going to give you a, a few of these, and then we'll wrap this up. You see the second seal is uh, world war. Peace is gone from the world. I guess I could hold this and says, hmm, I need an earpiece. I just need to talk in them sometimes. Thank you. You're so good to me. All right, so you used to famine. What's the fourth one? Did you see? Was that a threat or was it actually dead? <laughs> Persecution, right? Uh, next one I have, uh, land believers death. Yeah, persecution. Okay, and then day of the Lord. You're good. Thank you. So that's what you're looking at. So I believe that here, day of the Lord, is what Second Thessalonians chapter 2 is talking about. And that will be what it's described there, we, I pointed out, our gathering together to Him. We know that as an event that has come to be known as the rapture. But I believe that's when that will happen. Then, ironically, this is all. This is all. This all will happen. So, Antichrist is revealed. Well, what's he going to do? A lot of good things. Then you're going to have world war, you're going to have famine, you're going to have mass persecution of believers. So the image in heaven is the believers go to God and say, how long, O Lord? How long? We have our brothers and sisters on earth. Like, how long, O Lord, until you're going to avenge our blood? Like, our lives were taken for the cause of the gospel. And and the scripture says God gives them a a white robe and says, wait a little longer. So then persecution, then the day of the Lord comes, and then is the vengeance of God upon the earth, what we know as the Great Tribulation. Just to add to what you're saying, um, Matthew 24... It's knocking at the door. Matthew 24 is all about the tribulation. Mm-hmm. And then verse 29 says immediately after the tribulation yep. of those days, not yep. before, after, yep. the sun will be dark and the moon will not give her light. It's exactly what it's exactly the language of Revelation six. Yeah. If you want to listen to a fun first person that I've ever met that believes like that. That's what God I'm sorry, I'll shut up. Yeah. So here's the deal. There are a lot of good people. there are we have elders on our on our staff that don't agree with me. That's okay. They're they're pre trib. There's people in this room that don't agree with me. That's okay. I don't, like, some of our elders are some of the finest students in the Bible. Like, if you listen to Chuck Lindsay over at our Grand Blank location, he is a great student of the Bible, loves the Word of God, great reverence for the Scripture. Um, he disagrees with me. That's okay. That's all right. This is what, and I, I didn't read books about this. I read the Bible, and this is what I felt like Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, and Revelation were saying. You can come to your own conclusion, that's okay, as long as it's rooted in what the Scripture says. Um, I will make one recommendation to you. 
There's a Johnny Cash song called Matthew 24. So that's my gift to you tonight on the way home. So <laughs> just listen to it and then think about the fact that my, uh, my six-year-old daughter, who has no upper teeth, right, her top three teeth are gone, sings Matthew 24 is knocking at the door. So from Johnny Cash. It's kind of fun. All right, everybody. Let's pray real quick. We'll get out of here. Thanks, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for just your truth. Lord, I pray that um, with a respectful and gentle spirit, Lord, we would discuss uh, people who believe differently. And I pray, Lord, with gentleness and respect, we would discuss people who are in darkness and need uh, the transforming light of the gospel. I pray, Lord, that your revelation to us would not lead to an ounce of pride, but that your revelation to us would lead to great humility and um, great grace, because that's what we've received from you. So thanks you. Thank you for tonight, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. See you, everybody. Exhausted.